stay and roll, stay and roll. And uh, after a while, he just went to him, told him something in Portuguese, and off they walked. Dead quiet in the car. Car pulls out. He keeps looking at me through a rear mirror. Girl just keeps staring at me. The informant and I are just looking at each other like, what the hell just happened? Dead quiet. So then all of a sudden now I start seeing the lights of, of uh, Rio. We're back on the street. I guess he must have given him the okay, right? So anyways, we go, get off. We go into a club and, and all, and that, that now I feel more comfortable. We start drinking, we start talking. No business yet, no business yet. It's all like, he's just testing me, right? Drinks, this and that. The night goes on just like that. Right. But anyway, the night I ended up having to, 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 to pretend I was drunk so that I could get home, get back to the location. So finally, when I did finally get back, um, you know, we're, I get a call. We're, we're out of there in the morning. DEA attache is fuming, right? You broke protocol. You put everybody in danger. And I want you out of here right now. You guys, tomorrow, you're on the first flight out. You're gone. And he was right. I mean, I, I, you know, imagine if something would have happened, it would have been all my fault out of his control. But as we're there, I, and I felt like we were school children getting chewed out by this guy. He's screaming and yelling, telling us this. And I'm just sitting there and a knock on the door. Brazilian National Police come in <clears throat> and they got transcripts from from a phone they're tapping. And it turns out that the guy, this uh, brujero, this uh, witch doctor or whatever, was a guy who would have knowledge of all these loads because he would be blessing all these loads. And they had been looking for this guy. They didn't know exactly where. And they boom, he appears on their wire talking about, hey, we've met the guy, me, uh, who's going to help us move these 500 kilos that they needed to be moved and all that. And it turns out the Brazilian police are saying, no, 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 this guy can't leave. He's got to stay here and work this out. So the EA guy was so mad, so mad. He just left. He just left. But but we had a good DA agent on our team who took the heat for us. And eventually that turned out to be a great case. We ended up arresting him and, uh, and he, uh, they found my undercover business card on him. And he said, Oh yeah, that's some guy I, I, I dealt with on a water deal, nothing doing. So he never knew. <laughs> I'm just, I'm, well, good. I mean, so I, I worked out in some capacity at least, but I'm just laughing at the part yeah. you're talking about running your hands through your hair. Cause you're doing it. I'm like, somebody looks at you. Why are you doing that? It's just really human. I'm sorry. You know, I can't exactly. Help. You know, yeah. I mean, you do it once or twice. Yeah, it's OK out of nerves. But when you keep doing it over and over, the guy's getting like, what's going on here? Right. So but but that's not a good a good uh, sign anymore. At least that didn't work for me. I never wanted to use that anymore. <laughs> no, hey. And but it, the good thing about it is that somebody I well, I'm sure down the road when you were talking with younger agents coming on the job okay. as you acquire this experience, you were probably able to tell them about this particular thing as a lesson in what not to do. Exactly. As I, as I rose up in the ranks and eventually became an ASAC myself and oversaw undercover operations, uh, that was one of the things I, I, I said, listen, we have to establish good communications, good, you know, make sure that we have always visual, always this, you know, and I understood their plight because I had been an undercover officer for a long time. And, um, and again, when I say undercover, it was like, we, we didn't do it like, uh, like for example, Joe Piston that who invested, you know, five, six years in, in, into this and, and really, really like cost a lot of, of not only of, 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 of funds, but his personal life and, and all these things, right? Um, we did it, you know, hit, 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 hit quick ones, quick ones, quick ones. Some would last a couple of months, some would last a day or two, a week. That's the nature of our undercover. I always wanted to have a long-term, uh, you know, deep cover after an organization, but, you know, we just weren't structured that way. Um, so that's what we did. I could tell you, Mike, that there would be days where in the morning, you know, and my partner, Mike would say, okay, we got to deal with, you know, so-and-so. So I would go and do a, a, pick up a suitcase or sell a suitcase or do that in the morning. And then in the afternoon, we'd be doing another one and maybe in the night doing another one, like three in a row, so much so that it was just too much. It was getting, it was getting, uh, you know, to the point where, you know, what happens to it as an undercar, so you, you have to always be on point. Right. And, and, and a lot of people always think, Oh, you live in the great life. You're driving, you know, any kind I, I had a, you know, convertible Corvette. I had a, I had a, I had a, you know, BMW's latest model, whatever I wanted to drive. I had, 
We had apartments on the beach. We had, you know, warehouses. We had a farm. Never showed up to the office. I had the latest phones, best clothes, you know, always doing that kind of stuff. Um, and, and everybody's looking at you like, oh, man, you guys, you're living the life. But you're really not. You're, you're, you're not really having a good time. You're constantly worried about, is somebody going to make me? Is somebody going to do this? And, and, you know, you have to be remembering all this, recording this. And while you're doing all this, right, you're risking your neck. You're living it. You're, 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 you're impacting your family. You're doing all these things. You know, you go out to dinner with someone to, to discuss a low or a deal. And somebody questions, you know, a $20 drink that you had. Because why are you we spending $20 on a drink? You know, um, why can't you just get, you know, a beer? <laughs> like, dude, I wasn't thinking about that. This guy here is ordering lobsters and, and champagne, right? And I'm going to be, no, no, let me have a, a, a Bud Light, please. You know, no, you have to play the role. And right. that's another thing you were, you know, was an obstruction, right? You had some good supervisors that allowed you free reign to do what you needed to do and, and others Others, no. Others, others were like, you know, let's reel it in. We're spending too much money. And, you know, why, why do we need to keep this operation going? And things like that. So you were always constantly battling all, all those things. And I don't even think the dealers lived that life, too, because think about it. They're worried about is somebody going to try to knock me off? Is somebody going to try to rip me off? It's just the day that I, you know, I get killed. We go to a deal. It goes bad. And, you know, I'm dead. So I don't even think there's because there's if you remember, there's a scene in Miami Vice where Crockett and Tubbs are walking somewhere. And he's talking about his undercover identity. And he says to every sleaze bucket drug deal, he goes down the line, you know, they, in, on the streets of this city, I'm Burnett because his, uh, his last uh, name, you know, we was Sonny yeah. Burnett as an undercover dealer. Yeah. So there's that. And there's the stress of it, too, because you're doing noble work. And as you said earlier, it's a dirty job. And somebody's going to do it in reference to Border Patrol. It applies here, too. But you're always wondering, you know, one wrong move, one uh, slip of the tongue here. And my name and my plaque could be hanging up on the memorial wall that we have at the office. And you don't want that. And neither does your family either. So the mid nineties is an interesting point because that brings us to your time working in Venezuela. And we talked about the importation of illegal goods and, and, and how they can be trafficked. What people don't think about though, and this is interesting, is vehicles. So many stolen vehicles, it's a lucrative market. There's so many illegal chop shops here in America and abroad. And you had a big role in what would later become the BASC, Business Anti-Smuggling Coalition, yep. that not only spotted these stolen vehicles, but impacted policy at the federal level in the White House during the Clinton years that allowed these vehicles to come back. Um, so take me through that particular operation, because like I said earlier, when people think of smuggling, vehicles is probably the last thing that comes to mind. Yeah, it, it, so it was a learning experience for me, right? After, after, I guess, five or six years doing the undercover stuff in Miami back and forth, it, it was great, but... But it got to a point, Mike, where, where I needed to rent a vehicle one time and they had put such strict restrictions now on, on the expenditures and how you use the funds for undercover purposes. And we needed to rent a vehicle one afternoon to, to do a case, to go do a meeting. And I had to write a memo. I had to get it through the, the 20 you know, different supervisors to approve and, and all that. And at the end of the day, I just said, you know what? Forget about this. This is not worth it. And I decided... I wish I could just work somewhere else, we'll work overseas, do something like that. So I looked around and there was an opening in, in, in Caracas, Venezuela uh, at the time. I knew nothing of, you know, other than, you know, the international travel I had done, but I didn't know anything about, you know, foreign uh, policing and, and, and working in our, in our, in our um, you know, our footprint overseas, right? In the diplomatic scene. So Anyways, I applied. I, I ended up getting getting the job overseas. I, I was briefed and I was sent to Caracas <clears throat> for, uh, to a three man office there, and uh, learning. I had to learn the ins and outs. Uh, you know, working the embassy environment because you know they're on a mission there, and their mission could be all. There's different agencies there working their different missions, right? So you had to get along with everybody, understand and understand what your mission was, right? What was the U.S. Customs mission there at the time? And for for us. It was to facilitate import export. That's what it was. So, so here I come from a, 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 a drug investigation background, right? Like where I'm focused on drugs, drugs, drugs. But you had a DEA a group and a DEA presence in country that that's what their role was overseas, right? So, um, although we didn't give it up 100%, our office was never going to give up because we always had the border authority, right? And 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 we considered drugs crossing back and forth part of our uh, you know, workhouse. Um, but 
but more so more important to the mission overseas was the 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 you know cooperation with the government as far as you know the, your mission overseas right and our mission for customs was facilitating imports and exports right so <clears throat> that's what i opened my eyes completely to a whole different world right when i came from border patrol to us customs whole different world now within us customs going overseas whole different world and even though as you were you were mainly what, what was what, what is uh, known as a representative as a liaison officer you were granted immunity in the country you had no authority to do anything but what you did was you worked with you know you established excellent relationships with locals right uh, or or and when i say locals the host country officials right from the police to the, to the customs officers to the in venezuela it was the guardia nacional uh, they were the principal ones um and 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 that's what you did you and then i also had different relations with like the 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 equivalent of what is the irs they had certain investigative powers and so what you did is you worked with them and tried to you know so so a, a domestic office has an investigation they need some information in venezuela they'll send you what they call a collateral case we would take those collateral cases and work with our local counterparts and try to solve it for them or try to facilitate whatever information they needed and at the time, um, <clears throat> the Caracas office, <clears throat> excuse me, Mike, the Caracas office oversaw Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, Suriname, and Guyana, and French Guyana. So those countries were also part of my scope at that time. So I traveled a lot to Colombia, traveled a lot of different areas. But um, in this particular case, and we, we facilitated many investigations, many, many, many things, we, we provided training we provided fraud seminars, uh, whatever issues the country had, we tried to help them. And also it worked the other way. If uh, the Venezuelan authorities had any investigations in the U.S. that they needed our help, well, of course, we would then facilitate with them. One of the things I did while we were there is uh, set up training endeavors, right? We would identify guys we wanted to sort of like, you know, uh, foster relationships with and we would get them and then take them to Florida, take them to Miami. For example, one team I took to Miami and, and showed them how the uh, customs rover team worked, how they identified swallowers. At the time, there was a big swallower problem uh, in and out and all this other stuff. Uh, it, was, it was really good and it was great. You know, you develop excellent work. We had undercover cases, other, other agents coming into Venezuela to pick up, you know, uh, uh, money from money laundering operations. Uh, so you would work with your locals and set them up, set up surveillances, you know, let the transaction go through. It was it was really it was really uh, um, endearing work, but it it would also made me a more rounded customs agent, right? I learned about the actual import laws. You know, you'd have you know, just like you would work a customs uh, a money laundering case or a drug case, you would also work you know stolen parrot case or stolen. So the this this insurance <clears throat> entity, the NCIB, I believe it was called National Crime Insurance Bureau at the time, had a major issue of cars being stolen and then transported overseas, in particular to Venezuela. So, so they knew that these groups were taking cars, high-level cars, you know, Lexuses, Infinities, all top-level cars, and, and being stolen from <clears throat> dealerships, you know, all kinds of areas, and then shipped to Venezuela, where they would be put into action, put into place. So we would get lists and lists of VIN numbers for us to check. And every time I try, I would give it to certain, you know, uh, counterparts that I worked with there. And I would always get back on oh, no, all these are negative, negative, negative. But so I developed a relationship with a particular individual uh, who had access to these databases and, 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 and he took it upon himself. And this was a very dangerous thing for him, but he did do it. Took it upon himself to go identify where these cars were at. And he took pictures of them. He, he confirmed that certain VIN numbers. And so he gave me evidence that showed that these cars were being used by high level government officials. So it was, it was not a, you know, so I brought that forth to the embassy and the, the embassy did not really particular have an interest in this because they didn't want to embarrass anybody. Right. So they just said, listen, just <clears throat> make sure, try to get these back, back and forth. But, but that caused a major issue, right? And so the FBI, the, the, my counterpart for the FBI also had a similar issue. So we got together and we started talking to our counterparts and talking to them and saying, look, we know these cars are here. We need to find them. And so 
uh, it got to a point where we got, you know, the prosecutors involved, the, the prosecutor's office in Venezuela, and they were saying, okay, give us your source. And we're like, no, we can't give you our source, but we can tell you that these cars are here. So, well, we need to know who the source is and we need to know where these cars are. So we were summoned to a meeting at, at a high level meeting with high level individuals in, in, in the Venezuelan uh, law enforcement community. And I brought my files with the evidence and we sat there and I didn't open them. Um, and I sat there with the FBI uh, counterpart and we talked to them and we said, look, we need these vehicles back. There were hundreds of vehicles, but they weren't going to give us these hundred vehicles. But we had identified four of them or four or six. I can't remember at the time um, that had been specifically assigned to very high level people. There. And we said, we need these back. They're like, well, how do we know they're there? Whatever. And I said, in these files, I have the evidence that they're there. I'll tell you where they're at. And I give them the locations. And they, you know, poker face, didn't acknowledge or, 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 or deny. And uh, we ended up getting those back. Like, because we pushed so hard. We, they never, I, we never gave up our source. We never, but we were very much persona, uh, not appreciated there <laughs> Um, but we ended up getting those loaded onto a, a container and shipping them back. And I don't know. And, and eventually we uh, ended up establishing a mutual uh, law enforcement assistant agreement with, with the country on the repatriation of stolen vehicles uh, that was signed into. And that was a, something very good that the embassy was able to accomplish with our Department of Justice and headquarters and, and their uh, Department of the Ministry, I guess, uh, in, in Venezuela. It was it was. It was great, but it took a long time. And at the end of the day, if you really look at it from a case statistic value, we only returned six vehicles, right? And there was hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them stolen. And I'm sure it continued. There's a piece on, on either 60 Minutes or CNN. I can't remember, right? You know, uh, the reporters went down there. They had all kinds of, inf and, and, and they interviewed me and they interviewed a bunch of people um, about this situation. I think that took it to another level. And, and then the Venezuelan government got more involved uh, in, in that. And, uh, but it, it, was, it was an experience working, working overseas. Man, that is, that is some, even if it's six, it's something, it's progress. And they had six people that got their vehicle back. I mean, these are some great stories. And that brings us 1997 after some time in Venezuela from 93 to 97. Here you are now from Miami to Chicago. So here you are, growing up in a relatively tropical climate and now you're going to the windy city which you know i know this growing up in connecticut my entire life when the summers are hot they're hot but when the winters are cold they're cold we have some brutal winters in this part of the country and you were there from 97 and 99 so take me through the decision to go out there and the two years you spent there including operation casablanca so <laughs> it's funny because my wife, you know, she, she's amazing. She went, has gone with me everywhere I've gone. And, and, uh, she, she, she's from Venezuela, right? So she's from uh, this warm climate. And, um, we, uh, you know, at the time I had been a senior agent now, a senior special agent, and it was coming up on a time where I could, you know, the next progression to be a, a group supervisor. Right. So I had put in for different spots. One of the spots that I had, that had, um, considered me was Minnesota, uh, Minnesota. There was a Minneapolis and that's even colder than you know, Chicago, I think. And, uh, and they had actually interviewed me and I think they had actually selected me for that area. Um, however, um, and, and it was going to be at my next spot, right? So I, I was going to take it because it meant my next progression. And, and, in, and when you do an overseas tour, um, at the time you, you could do three years and then another two, I think the maximum was five. Some people did more, some people did less, but at the time they were kind of work, they were kind of, uh, enforcing, they didn't want you to do more than five years overseas. Um, uh, and so, so I knew my time was coming up and it was time to, to head back to the States. The question was, where do I go? Do, you know, I went there as a, as a 13 GS 13, do I leave there as a 13? I thought the time there, I grew as an agent. I learned more about customs. Uh, so I, I thought I, I was ready to be a supervisor. I had managed some big operations and I thought I could, I could do it. Right. So anyways, Minneapolis was where the opening was and, 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 and I was selected. However, during, during some conversations between the offices there, because Minneapolis was a sub age, a sub office of 
the Chicago SAC office. Um, Operation Casablanca had been in had been in full swing, right? Operation Casablanca was a major money laundering uh, operation and investigations, which started out of the uh, SAC Los Angeles office, and they were they were, you know, moving and shaking like 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 we say, right? They were making all kinds of headway into major, major money laundering organizations, all the cartels, the, the Colombians. I mean, they were, they were like heavily into them and money was being transported all over the place. And a lot of that operation was happening in Chicago. So the Chicago office at the time had a task force that would work on it. But um, um, for some reason, for some reason, um, the Los Angeles office wasn't uh, content with the way that office was managing it. Right. So, so um, they wanted, and, and, and the Chicago office also had at the time um, wanted to, you know, I guess, uh, amplify their office, become more diverse and all that. So they, they said, listen, um, we have a guy that's going to Minneapolis and, and another guy going to Chicago. Why don't we switch them up? You know, I had overseas experience. I had a lot of experience with undercover operations and I had, you know, a lot of informants. So they interviewed me and, and the, the ASAC that interviewed me talked and said, look, you would be moving here. You would be doing this. And I gave him some references. And one of my, one of the references was my old, an old boss of mine, uh, who, who, you know, in talking me up said, oh yeah, he's paid millions of dollars in informants. He would be great for your office, whatever. Right. So, so, you know, they thought, okay, great. This is great. So they made the switch and I was able to go and, and now go to, to Chicago. When I get there, somebody had been upset that, um, that, they had picked me, and 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 one of the one of the reasons why was because of my ability at the time to, to have all these informants, and that I had paid all these informants. So, unbeknownst to me, I get there and I'm all happy. I got my supervisor job. You know, it's going to be a new. You know, I'm back in the states. It's going to be a new, exciting thing. Um, and I get called by the our legal counsel saying, "Hey, Alex, uh, do you have records of all these informants you've paid?" And I said, yeah, I'm sure they're somewhere. I don't have them with me, but I'm sure, you know. And he says, yeah, because, you know, your old boss said that uh, you paid millions and millions of dollars to informants. And, and uh, now we have to produce that because someone is like uh, suing the agency because they picked me over that person or whatever. And I'm thinking, now, why does that fall on me? Now I have to go find it. So, Mike, I had to go and research and find and all these payments. I called, you know, luckily we had a great uh, CI confidential informant coordinator in, in, in Miami who kept meticulous records and all that. Anyways, I was able to get a lot of the, the evidence. I mean, you know, I think he had said over $3 million and I, I never had not paid that much money, but I had paid very close to it. And I was able to get a lot of that evidence and show, uh, but it was like, Oh my God, now I have to prove that this is what I have to do. But, but it was really great. The, 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 the team in Chicago were great. They were, they already had, they had probably one of the best task forces. They had it down. These are, these are the guys who you would say, Hey, we're going to sit up on that car and they'd be there for days and would make seizures left and right. Uh, it was, it was a good time. So we, we, what we did is really actually support operation Casablanca and theirs, but, but having worked with some of the, the team that had from LA who some of them were actually uh, out of the Miami office. And I knew, I asked if I could develop our own operation in Chicago, which we later did and later became really successful in Chicago ourselves, right? Because so here's LA in our area operating their case. We're working the case for LA. Well, you know, all that stuff and all that activities happen in Chicago. Chicago should be doing their own thing too. So our team um, wrote up a great operation and we submitted, we got approved. And so simultaneously we would work both. We would work, support the, the uh, SAC Los Angeles office with Casablanca and all these money laundries and, and operation, you know, our operation, which was Las Brisas at the time. And I, re, I, I this is how, how prevalent it was, Mike. We're sitting at a Home Depot one evening. It's snowing. Mm. It, it's eight at night. It is freezing and it's snowing. There's a Chicago <laughs> PD car parked way in the distance and and you could see the the, the, the warm you know, the, the smoke coming out because the, someone's in the car and they're just looking the other way it was way, way down. Right. So we're supposed to be picking up four million dollars, four million dollars. I'm thinking, how are we and we're supposed to get that money, then move it forward so that they can continue to further the, the operation. And I'm, you know, new supervisor. I'm thinking, 
why don't we just seize that money and cause some commotion? And they're like, no, no, you're not going to seize this money. We, you know, bosses from California are calling and saying, don't you seize that money? We got this operation going. So I'm frustrated there. I'm sitting there watching this. And we have a film crew with us uh, who is working this operation because down the road, it was going to be a major story for, for, for U.S. Customs. So I'm sitting there with the film guy. We're talking back and forth. And, and we see the van show up, right? And now the, the, the undercover officers are from California. They've come in only for this. They're going to do the pickup, the exchange. They're going to drive away with the money, right? But in the meantime, our job is, the Chicago office job is, when we spot the vehicle coming in, we watch it. We let the money transfer go. And then we follow that vehicle to wherever it goes. And then later on down the road, start our own investigation from there, right? So that's what we're doing. We see the van pull up, the, the, the van pulls in, two guys get out, no bags, no nothing. Van's just there. They go, they meet up with our undercover guys, and they go in the store. <clears throat> the undercover guys makes a call to his contact and says, hey, stand by. They're going to go in, buy some bins, because the money's just in bags, and so they're going to buy some bins and put it in, in, in these bins, and that's what they're going to give us. Okay, so... That's what's happening, right? So you see them come back out with the bins. And as they're doing it, they open the door and there's a guy, guy goes inside and all of a sudden they load up a bin. You, I'm talking about those storage bins, right? Those large, you know, I don't know, 10, whatever gallon, you know, storage bins filled with money. And the guy's handing it off, it flips. And all this cash just poof, lands in the snow, like stuck. And you can see it. Money. I'm thinking, oh my God, the guy's, the guy is 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 uh is like can't believe it. The guy was in the car and the board. like, oh my god! I'm thinking we could just seize it right now. This is the perfect timing, and no, we couldn't. But they quickly put it back in, shoved it in, and eventually the the, the pickup occurred. And we ended up following them later on. And later on, you know, did some consent searches and other seizures. And how, but that's how prevalent it was. Here it is at eight o'clock at night in Cicero, Illinois, at a Home Depot, four million dollars on the snow. <laughs> Just another night in uh, Chicago. Man, that is, you would never <laughs> think that that would be the hub. I mean, you hear about Miami. Okay, yeah, it makes sense. The waterway is oh, right yeah. there. But Chicago, I mean, it's everywhere. It was it's, everywhere. It could be prevalent anywhere. And you're seeing it recently in New York, too. So, you know, federal law enforcement after the events of 9-11 changed a lot because now, in addition to worrying about drug smuggling or smuggling of any uh, kind of illegal property, there's the counterterrorism aspect to it, too, because you know, bombs can be smuggled. Any weapon that could be used as a potential uh, choice for destruction uh, in the name of whatever evil cause can be used. So as far as customs in, at post 9-11, take me through the change in procedure and making sure that customs did its part to make sure that something like that never happened again. Right. So that's a great point, Mike. So again, <clears throat> I leave I leave the Chicago office, uh, you know, I had, I had my, uh, an unfortunate incident. My, my father-in-law passes away. So my wife is, is distraught and we, we got to get back to South Florida so she could be with the family and we could be here. So I asked for a transfer and, and I got it. And, and I went now down to Miami. I, I became the group supervisor of one of the uh, many money laundering groups. And then eventually was able to, to move up and, and get my ASAC job. And so as an ASAC, I oversaw seven different narcotics groups, right? Seaports, airports, private craft, you know, uh, the river, all kinds of, all, all kinds of uh, uh, groups, right? So it gave, ex it gave me exposure to a lot of the things U.S. Customs did, right? We're stopping individuals, we're, but, but with, with, at the time, what U.S. Customs was investigating, primarily drugs, money, and other smuggling type weapons and things like that. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then, of course, 9-11 happens, and everything is just thrown into chaos, right? We continue, we, we, we start now because of our databases of passengers and flyers and all that. We were very, very in tune with who's coming into the country, who's exiting the country. And all those systems now are being requested by other agencies like, hey, can you help us with this? Can you help us with that? So, so then when, when all of a sudden, uh, um, uh, uh, I think it was 2003, when, when, when the agencies sort of merged, you know, uh, in 2002, the act passes and, and, and uh, Homeland Security is, is established. And in 2003, the actual merger starts to occur, um, even with all the friction that occurred, right? Because a lot of people were not happy 
you know, customs agents were not happy that now, now they have to do immigration work and immigration officers were, you know, by the most part, they, they, they benefited from it because it was a different job, but some of them, their guys, you know, didn't feel appreciated because their work was tough. And, and for years they had been requesting assistance, assistance, didn't really get the resources. And now all of a sudden, you know, there's a merger, right? So, but those who saw the potential in working with, um, you know, absorbing the authorities from each other, right? And using that rather than fighting it, those are the ones that moved up. Those are the ones that, that had the future, right? Because, you know, you know, now you can in, in use your customs authority and your immigration authority to, you know, proceed with investigations that have potential terrorist ties, right? Your, our, our knowledge of money laundering and anti-money laundering antics, um, you know, coupled with the years and years and years of smuggling experience that we have, this is the way to go. This was the, the way to go about it. So partnering up with other agencies, particularly with the FBI, uh, that was the way to go at that time. So then we, we established Joint Terrorism Task Force. We participated in them. Um, I, I was sent to headquarters, <clears throat> what we call a TDY or temporary duty, to go and, and help in the process of best practices. What were the best practices to, to, to adapt from each other's agencies? And, and while there, um, you know, working with the different headquarters teams to set up because, you know, immigration came over with, uh, they had a certain way of documenting informants. Customs had a certain way of documenting informants, which is the best way to do it. So all that had to be, you know, merged together to the point of what badge are we going to use? Do we use the customs badge? Do we use the immigration badge? Do we invent a badge? That's how technical and tactical it got. And uh, there was all along that path, Mike, a lot of friction. But meanwhile, the, 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 the issue still was there. Who's working the terrorism cases and how do we do it? So FBI was always the lead, became, you know, uh, came through as the lead on that. And, and we had to work with them and handing over any potential terrorist cases. But, but when you had good relationships, as we did, um, we were able to then work our own investigations, right? So I, I, as I said, I went to, to Washington for 45 days and, and helping on that. When I came back, I was now no longer the ASAC of the narcotics group. I was now the ASAC of different divisions, uh, the Domestic Security Task Force. Wild, all kinds of immigration issues, uh, individuals that had suspect paths. Who who was down here on certain visas? Uh, you know, as the folks who perpetuated 9/11. You know, investigate that. Those are all, all kinds of things. Is what we started getting involved with, um, and so this was all new to us. So, you know, um, as you as, as you know, if you know, Bob was part of the JTTF, he as he always did make great relationships with there and work cases. He knew, you know, although he had not worked terrorism cases before, he knew uh, how to work the information that was needed, right? So he could say, oh yeah, I know where to get those systems. We'll go to this, place. we go to that place. So this was, he, he employed those type of tactics and that's what we did too, right? We, we used our knowledge of prior investigative activity with customs and, 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 and immigration to deal with now what was the terrorism risk. And I'll tell you, a lot of it was, you know, chasing our tail, right? But but you had to, right? You got information, some guys under a bridge taking pictures, you shoot on out there and you figure it out and you get the guy and, you know, he's just a tourist taking pictures, right? But how do you differentiate that? It was tough. It was some tough years at the beginning, but, but overall, regardless of the friction that occurred, I think border security really was strengthened. And as much as I, you know, uh, I always, you know, I was customs, even though I was uh, immigration at the beginning and border patrol, but customs was what I, where I felt at home. And I always thought that, that the need to break up the agencies wasn't necessary, uh, that I think we could have accomplished more by giving the right resources to all the agencies, right? Um, but once it occurred, it did strengthen the border, right? So information, if you have the right contacts and you write the, the right ability is shared um, and that was the key, you know, even not necessarily in a task force concept, Mike, just just reaching out, picking up the phone, having, you know, calling your FBI contact, calling your DEA contact, your ATF contact, your local contact, having and maintaining those relationships, whether in a task force setting or just having them. That's what was key. 
that, that's and, and I still to this day think that is what is the right way to work uh, law enforcement and terrorism. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of like, you know, uh, Bob's into basketball, as we both know. He was coaching and he was a player in his younger years. You know, everybody on a good team, look at the Milwaukee Bucks. Okay, Giannis had his role, right? Bobby Portis had his role. The point guard had his role. And they all filled it. You know, they weren't worried about when, eh, what, what about my playing time? What about this? What about that? It's just, here's my role. I'm going to perform within that role and I'm going to do the best job that I can. And, you know, now... <laughs> I feel like, yeah, you mentioned there's that friction. Naturally, you know, there's agencies that think that they can do it better than the other agency. But when you combine the strengths, kind of like what the FBI has done, for example, in New York with the NYPD for their counterterrorism operation, you combine the strengths and you play to the strengths. Great things can be done because the thing that about terrorism is that, you know, you can understand on the surface where drug dealers get their money. They deal enough of this stuff. You know, unfortunately, there's a lot of people who have addictions and that's going to, you know, make, make you a lot of money for as evil as it sounds. And it is, but it's the truth. Terrorism, I always wonder, where do they get the money? Because I was told this by a friend of mine who's a retired NYPD bomb squad detective and counterterrorism specialist that Al-Qaeda legit for many years uh, had their own magazine, you know, that was produced color, photos, everything, much like you would see with Time or Sports Illustrated. I'm like, where are you getting this money from? You know, but that's that's the job now that uh, these federal agencies have you know, been tasked to figure out and they do a great job of it. So, you know, to go over to your time in Spain, we'll hit on a few more things and the time has flown by. We've been talking for a while and I've enjoyed every minute of it. I've heard so <laughs> yeah, many sorry, great stories. I, I can get long winded in stories. I that's apologize. fine. That's fine. This is, I always say I never complain about that because in, the, in an open ended forum like this, the more the yes talk, the, get, you know, the more they share, the better. I don't want anybody to be short in conversation. So I thank you for that. Uh, your time in Spain. Uh, by this point, you have over 20 years uh, with with customs. You've seen a lot. You've done a lot. So being more experienced, tell me first about why you took on this assignment. Of course, once you took on the assignment, the duties that you had. So so Spain, it was a. So I had been asked to go um, uh, temp on temporary assignments uh, periodically to Spain and Italy. And we were just looking, my wife and I we were looking to, wow, what an experience it would be for the kids to be able to work out of one of these offices overseas, you know, Paris, Rome, or, 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 or um, Spain. So um, <clears throat> at the time, uh, you know, our, our representatives there, our, our attaches there, they, um, they go on home leave. And so, they need someone to go in there to the office and just, you know, sort of like it's on cruise control. Just go there in case anything happens, you know, have a have a have a, a presence there. Right. So I had gone on a couple of TDYs, you know, to Spain and it was beautiful. Um, the work was amazing. Everyone thinks, oh, you're going to go to these, you know, you go to Paris, you go to Rome, you go to Madrid and you think, oh, this is, you know, you're, you're, you're on easy street. But there is a lot of work there. And the and the European uh, Union you know, and the way they work, uh, it is, it is incredible work and, and very, very um, uh, enlightening, right? So it, it just another aspect of my career, right? So, so I had, I had the ability, I had the language capability. Um, I always really, really wanted to do this. And, uh, <clears throat> and uh, so my wife was on board and we decided, hey, let's, let's, let's go try. I mean, I applied and, 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 and made it, uh, but it was, it was a, a great experience. And again, I had already had previous experience working overseas uh, when I worked in Venezuela. Uh, and, and I think now I had been had become a more mature agent, a better prepared manager. And I thought this was the next level, right? I, I, I was now an ASAC, uh, which is an assistant special agent in charge. And so being an attache is sort of like your own director of your own office. You, you kind of, even though it's a smaller office in some cases, Madrid was a three-man office at the time, four-man office plus some interns, whatever. But um, it was it was fantastic, and, and and again, my ability to have established relationships with you know FBI counterparts and DEA counterparts, um, I wanted to do that. So it was um, it was really good, and and we worked very very close with the European authorities, particularly the Spanish uh, police and, and Spanish customs and and Guardia Civil. Those were the main ones there. Uh, we established uh, money laundering operations there. They allowed us to have undercover bank accounts, which is something that was basically unheard of. Um, you know, we did all kinds of money pickups. We did child pornography uh, and exploitation operations, identified rings, 
it, you name it, we, we got it. We, you know, um, we at one point, you know, needed to get on certain vessels to, to acquire certain equipment. Uh, our, our relationship with them were so that they would just open the doors for us. It was, it was really good. It was really, really uh, very good working with them. They, they allowed us for the first time to teach at their academy. Uh, they allowed us to come in as instructors and, 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 you know, teach a course in English, teach tactics, all kinds of things. And in turn, we then uh, received uh, uh, training from them as well that qualified as, you know, college credit courses. It was, it was amazing. It was, it was great to do that. And it was, it was a neat environment because you may be, you know, sitting uh, across the table from, you know, Alexander Mayorkas. That's one of the individuals that I dealt with when he came. He, his arrival at the time uh, for Homeland Security, you know, we, we took him to dinner. We took him to, uh, for whatever purposes he was there. Or uh, the Janet Napolitano may have, may have also, you know, briefing her on the cases we needed, attending, you know, the, the, the summit meetings, uh, you, know, you know, briefing a, a, a congressman on issues. Um, it's just a myriad of things that you got involved with and at the same time, you know, you're also going to a diner. Uh, there's not many in Spain, but uh, Spain has the most incredible food and restaurants you'll ever imagine. But there was a, a diner and you'd go there to meet an informant and pay him, you know, a million dollars for his, his or her participation in, uh, in the, uh, one of the investigations that we had. That's the kind of stuff you did. It was, it was amazing. Um, we put on trainings. Uh, working, working with them, learned a lot about the different regions of Spain and the divisions and, and all the things that, uh, that, that the country was made of. It was, it was, it was really, really my time there. I loved it. I loved, I loved uh, what I did. So after 29 years, 2015, you call it a career. I imagine, you know, at this point you felt you had to have felt like you've done everything that you could have done. Is that what motivated you to retire or were you looking to stay longer, but I got a great job in the private sector. Tell me what went into that decision. Well, what happened, what happened, Mike was, so I really, really wanted to, um, to um, continue. Oh, I, I forgot. I, I forgot to say, you know, while in, while, while in Italy also, we got to gate cases like, you know, the, the theft of, you know, uh, pieces of, 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 of art, you know, from, from the Caesar's times, you know, things like that, that were, were so amazing that you never got a chance to do when, when you were domestically, right? Um, the Columbus letter, the famous Christopher Columbus on voyage wrote a letter uh, to, to, you know, the king and, and king and queen Isabella at the time of Spain, telling them about this voyage that he went when he discovered the, the Americas, right? And, and that letter is preserved in these museums and someone had stolen and made copies of that, the copies of the letter. We got to investigate the, the trying to return all that. That's something you would never get involved with. It's just cool history, right? But that's what the kind of stuff you did overseas. But, but, but yes, I got to a point where I loved what I did. I really did. I, I, I never imagined uh, moving into a private sector area. I always never planned for it. I always plan my government style career. I want to do a supervisor. I want to become an ASEC. I want to become an attache. I want to explore, you know, the different areas, right? I want to do this, but I never planned what am I going to do afterwards, you know? So my retirement eligibility was coming up, uh, but I also had another, I could have done potentially another year. in Spain. I was asking to see if they would allow me to, <clears throat> to, to finish out my career in Spain, right? Allow me, I had done five going on my sixth year, I wanted to do either one or two more if I could. Just I had all the contacts, I had everything. I was asking, but I guess leadership at the time said, "No, no, no. The fair thing to do is bring. You know, you have to do a headquarters tour. If you've never done a headquarters tour, you have to come to headquarters." And so I had never done that um, through all my career. I the only times I had been in headquarters was for presenting, presenting on, you know, rebudgeting our undercover operations or helping, you know, during the merger, uh, the best practices, always temporary assignments and never full time, right? So, um, and the reason why is because most of the time in my career, I had been doing undercover work or if not managing. And so, so I was never on those, on those hit lists that they would send to headquarters. Hey, here's agents available to go up there. So I, I was under the radar, flew under the radar during that time. 
So I never had been to headquarters. So the, the ruling, the policy at the time was you have to, you know, go and, uh, and do headquarters. I didn't want to. So I was starting to think, all right, what's my next step? And about that time, my daughter, <clears throat> my youngest daughter, decides she wants to go to college uh, in, in Colorado, right? She had different options, but she, she decides maybe we go. So we took a trip, myself, my wife and her, to Colorado to see, hey, maybe we can, um, <clears throat> you know, set her up. Let's set her up at the dorms. Let's set all, all these things up. And, uh, and then leave her. And then my wife and I would return, finish out my time in, uh, in, uh, in Spain, enjoy Europe as much as we could, and then maybe go to Washington. I don't know. I, I, I still not sure what to do. <clears throat> but while there, while in Colorado, my wife uh, decides that, hey, you know, I don't want to really leave her. I think we, she still needs us here and all that. So it became a bit of a dilemma. So I, I reached out to different people, hoping to, hoping to get a transfer to the Denver office. Um, but the Denver um, SAC at the time said, look, I, 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 I don't have any openings, but, but uh, another one of our um, uh, ex-agents is there. He's retired and he had been working for uh, Western Union and uh, had really, really, you know, done really well. And so I reached out to him and he goes, yeah, yeah, we, you know, hey, let's see, you know, how can you... How come you didn't call me? Let's talk. So we met, <clears throat> talked to him a little bit, and he explained to me what he does. It's the world of compliance. And so, you know, in law enforcement, <clears throat> excuse me, we look at, you know, the laws, right? How, how, how you're laundering money, how you're committing and violating laws. How are we going to approach you? You know, we, we develop probable cause. We, we you know, we, we get complaints. We go out and we after and we attack the, the individual or the the organization or the entity violating this law and we ap apply it, right? And so you might be successful in knocking out an organization, a couple of individuals. Um, in compliance, uh, it's a whole different world, especially anti-money laundering compliance. You are teaching people how to prevent, how, how someone will use your legitimate business to launder funds, through, right? A bank. And so, and so now you are actually helping and preventing, right? So I thought, oh, I never looked at it that way. I always thought law enforcement has it down. We, we know what we're doing with anti-money laundry. <clears throat> and to an extent, yes, for prosecutions, but for prevention, you know, if I can, as a compliance officer, for example, if I can teach a hundred of these, what we call frontline associates, the individuals that, you know, hey, I want to send money so, to this place. Okay, great. So they they look at your transaction, they question you, what is it for? Is it a legitimate? If you can teach a hundred of those people, a thousand of those people, a million of those people to identify potential uh, transactions that are, that could be, uh, you know, used for trafficking, drugs, you know, drug movement, paying for uh, terrorist uh, support, any of that, if you can potentially teach that and prevent that, and they prevent that, I think you are actually doing more in that effort than, than what the difficult job that law enforcement has to prove those investigations. So I was in, I was in and I, I, I started as a compliance officer. I was like, I, I went back and I said, okay, I'd like to apply for the job. I applied, I, I actually had to go back. I took more time off. I interviewed with the company, um, two incredible managers there. They, they, they looked at my record. They, they were worried that I was going to be bored. They said, look, you've done a lot in your career, you know, as a compliance officer, it's very tedious and meticulous. And I, I was ready, you know, I didn't realize how that was going to be, but I was ready to change and, and do something different. And I said, you know, look, I'm ready to, to, to look at it from a different perspective. So they gave me this opportunity and they did, and they hired me. And so all of a sudden I'm on the plane back to Spain. I realized, damn, I got a report there. <laughs> I've got all these household goods and all these things I got to move. So anyways, I went through that process, retired. I, I was eligible. Um, I, uh, <clears throat> I did all that. And so, and got the move and did it. It was very, very, uh, you know, uh, uh, stressful, but it was accomplished. So on the 28th, I retired from the Department of Homeland Security, right? Left Spain on the 30th. I was in Denver, Colorado, inside the Western Union office, sitting at Cuba <laughs> as a new compliance officer with no clue <laughs> what I was supposed to do, right? I, uh, 
you know, it, I, as an attache, as an agent, I knew every step. I was so confident and I could deal with any thing. I could do whatever I needed to do. I knew all the systems, who to talk to, what to do at all level, levels. And here I was sitting, looking at people talking about, you know, all kinds of, you know, uh, codes and systems and this and that. And I had, I was lost, but, you know, I got into it. I learned, I applied myself and I'm so glad I did. And I love, um, you know, what I do today. I, I run a team of uh, compliance officers that oversee, you know, the Caribbean. Um, but I, I, I did eventually work with the, the Mexico team and the, and the U S team and, and understand the, 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 you know, the dimensions there. And it's, it's a great, it's a great job. You know, you, you, I, I really feel again, like I said, Mike, that we are doing more in, in the, in the uh, push to, to assist law enforcement and not to allow transactions to go through legitimate businesses. Cause we, we really work on the training. We really engage with, with that. They call, they're called agents, the ones who move the money back and forth. And so we really engage with them and tell them, look, this is what you look for. And I tell them, you know, I tell them, this is my background. I, this is where I come from. This is what I would be investigating you for. If I saw these transactions and you weren't doing anything about it, this is what I would be looking at. So that has and carries some weight uh, in some of the instances. And, and, and it's been, you know, I've, I've been successful in being able to, 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 you know, establish good contacts and good uh, rapport with our, with our agents in the, in the region. So. Amazing. With this, this has been a podcast. <laughs> and it is now time. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> this has been a lot of fun, man. I, it flew by. It really did. And I could listen to you all day and I'll have to, if you ever want to come back, I have to bring you back if, if you want. Thank That's you, me. Mike. Yeah. Whatever, whatever, whatever you do, like we can talk about my acting career, my big yeah. acting. Career. We didn't even, we didn't even get to I'm that. Kidding. So yeah, no, we, I know you were in a couple of, you were in a couple of movies, so we could, we, I definitely have to bring you back at some point, but in the meantime, it is now time for a segment of this podcast. It's the final segment called rapid fire. Five minute run questions for me and five minutes for you. Are you ready? Absolutely, sir. <laughs> okay, so you kind of talked about it earlier with running your fingers through your hair. That was funny. But besides that call, is there any other call you can remember as among the funniest you ever handled? I got to tell you, Mike, this to me has always stayed with me. And every time I tell this story, it's like it, it, it cracks people up. And, and, I, and I at the time I thought, oh, my God, but, but looking back, it is right. So while in Venezuela and I remember I told you I, I took uh, uh, some of those um, uh, to establish, you know, uh, relationships and all, I would take them overseas or back to the U.S. and show them how we handle the swallower problem at the airport in Miami. And Miami has has a uh, a, a team of excellent customs officers that you know do that. And and then sometimes if they suspect you as a swallower, they would take you to an area where you consent and get a, a an X ray. Right? They have a medical facility there and they do that. Right? Well, the Venezuelan officers that I had brought there saw that firsthand and they thought, "Wow, what a great operation!" So when we went back to Venezuela. We continued this operation and went out to the different seaports and airports and conducted, you know, now we took them through a series of training in class. We took them to the U.S. They saw how it occurred. Now we brought them back to their ports, their own response where they have authority, and then to see how they would apply what they have learned, you know, in class and, in, and, in, and physically in their areas, right? So this one particular day, we're at the Caracas International Airport, and I'm sitting there talking with one, well, Doing, conducting some training there, and I'm sitting talking to one of the uh, uh, Guardia Nacional, the, 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 their National Guard guys, um, and we're talking. And, and one of the uh, National Guard guys comes running and says, "Mr. Alonso, Mr. Alonso, uh, the lieutenant wants to talk to you. We think we have one a swallower." I'm like, "What? Really? Oh, great!" So we run over to the back room there, and uh, and uh, <laughs> I walk into the to the room, and and they have this guy, uh, two two. Uh, Guardia Nacional uh, guys have them like almost hoisted up and the guy's like not, not touching the ground. You know, he's like, he's just half, and his eyes are tremendously scared and he's looking at me like, so the lieutenant, and they're the lieutenant, they're just calm as can be smoking a cigarette. And goes, hey, Alonso, come on inside. I want to talk to you about something. So you don't remember how you took us and you showed us in Miami how you do this. And, and he, they've got his bags open and they have, you know, laxatives. He's got uh, some Vaseline, some condoms and all the, 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 the evidence that you could say he could be a swallower, this individual. And I'm thinking, oh, they, they did good. He's got the tickets out. They look, you know, he's coming from Colombia, an area of Colombia, which is a source for this. And, and the flight was going to go to Venezuela, then Venezuela, Miami. Uh, so this is also a tactic that they use. And um, 
he's thinking this could potentially be a swallow. The only thing I'm missing, and then this is all occurring in, in Spanish, right? So the only thing I'm missing is that x-ray you guys have down there in, in Miami. So I was thinking, and I wanted to get your opinion, is what do you think if we put him through that? And he, and he nods over there. And so <laughs> in Caracas, they have this big giant uh, where they put luggage through to x-ray, you know, mm -hmm. custom. <laughs> put the luggage through the x-ray. It's a conveyor belt. Yeah, the, the old, like, it looks like an old, I don't know, rusted up. It's not rusted, but, you know, just to get the idea, it's an old-fashioned conveyor belt running, and they have these big metal thing, and you put suitcases through, and there's an X-ray image comes up, you know, to see if there's anything in there. And he's thinking, what if we put him through that? You think that'll work? <laughs> so they wanted to throw the guy on the conveyor belt, let him put him through the luggage thing to see if it would come out. I'm thinking, for a moment, I thought, man, I wonder if it would work, you know? So I said, no. I don't know. So I don't know. I'll leave that up to you. Uh, and and the, the guy was like, please, please don't let them do that. Don't let, I said, look, you know, it's your call here. Not sure that that would work, but, and he says, okay, thank you. I just wanted to get your opinion. And I left and I'm sure they put that guy through the conveyor, but I don't know if, you know, he developed some kind of radiation or something. I don't know. But to me, that was a funny story because I, I remember thinking, oh my God, they're going to really try to do it. You know, <laughs> so, anyways, that's the one that comes to mind, Mike. That's a good one. That's a good one. So we, you mentioned Starkham besides him and uh, of course, Miles' son too, who, who hopefully I can get on the show sometime soon as well. Uh, second yep. though, favorite colleagues you've had? Well, I, I, I gotta say this looks, so I spent most of my career working with, uh, with Miles uh, and, and Bob, but Bob's been super influential in, in my life from being an agent to, to later uh, years, you know, helping me in, in many aspects. He's just, it's just one of those guys, you know, like with an open heart that, that just does whatever you want, you know, whatever, you, whatever you need. Uh, that's, that's him. So I, I, I really thought about this and miles of course was my partner for many years and, and have a special relationship with him. And uh, so those two guys, I would say would be my favorite colleagues. <laughs> there you go. All right. Third favorite neighborhood in Miami. So again, um, I grew up, I grew up in Hialeah and people, people will say like, Hialeah, you know, that was like, uh, I don't know how it is now, but I, I, I grew up there all my life. And I still, to this day, go there to eat like the best Cuban food and uh, get, you know, good, good stuff there. So I know it's a crazy place, but I would say, I don't know that it's my, uh, you know, I, I don't, I would, I don't think I would, you know, reside there, but I love to go there. <laughs> <laughs> there you go uh so fourth i mean you kind of mentioned it just now talking about the cuban food is there a favorite bar or restaurant that stands out above the rest in miami so of course you know my, my one of my favorite places like i love seafood if, if you go to joe stone crab on on, on uh, in south beach that's probably one of the best places but lately i've been up here in uh up north a little bit in the jensen beach area and there's another place it's a great bar and excellent seafood called kyle g's mm -hmm. it's just Always jamming every day of the week. Doesn't matter what time, what day, doesn't matter what's happening. There's always people, cars. It's a great ambience. And my wife and I man, go there a lot. All right. So fifth and finally, given your experience is almost 30 years, uh, what advice would you give anyone coming into law enforcement, either locally or federally now? Yeah. So this is one I've thought about. Like, I don't know if I would, knowing what I know and knowing, I don't know. It's a different world now. It's a different world. It's a different agency you know, before it seemed like people had your back, you could do things. Uh, I don't know. You were more creative. You were able to do that. I don't know. It, you seem to be tied up now. I, I, I feel bad for, for a lot of the cops nowadays. I mean, you know, but it's still to me a great job. Um, so I would say if I had any advice to give, I would say is, you know, always cover yourself, you know, make sure you're safe, cover your butt. That's what you got to do in every situation. You never really expect something to go wrong, but it could always go wrong. So make sure you do that. If you are going to get into it, and, and this is a great profession and it's a very admirable, admirable profession, cover your butt. That's what, it, that's what it would be my advice. And that concludes what will be episodes 110 and 111 of the Mike Dunavon podcast. I got to thank <laughs> our mutual friend, Bob Starkman, for putting us in touch because this was fantastic. I really enjoyed hearing these stories. And like I said, you are welcome back anytime. So before we go, uh, is there any specific plugs or shout outs you want to give to friends, family, whatever the case may be? Well, Mike, I, I, I just, I, I'm appreciative. And I really, I, I've, um, for some time now, I've, 
thought about all the things I did and all these things and, and talking to Bob and he, and he wrote his book and he, you know, it's great. And, and he has incredible story. And it's got me to thinking too. It was like, man, I, I didn't realize this was my life. And, and so uh, I, it's caused me to reflect on, you know, how to, how to move forward and, and what, what it is. And so I'm very appreciative of, of the work I've done and, and now, you know, happy to move on and, and, and continue on, on this new path that I am. But I'm very appreciative of, of having the opportunity to speak to someone like you on such a platform. Um, and I didn't realize I got a lot of, you know, uh, comments on, on LinkedIn, <laughs> not, not even realizing who all these individuals and a lot of friends of mine and that, that, are, that are there that have as much or if not better stories than me that have been involved in all kinds of other things. And so um, just, just appreciative that I, that I'm able to say my story and that you have a platform, uh, that I can do it on. So thank you, Mike. Thank you for uh, coming on. Uh, so that, like I said, that concludes this episode on my end as by now, uh, if you don't know where to find me on social media, Twitter, Mike in New Haven, uh, Instagram, original underscore MC one LinkedIn, of course, for all the listeners out there, Mike Cologne, type in my name and then MIC apostrophe D for the first word of the podcast. And as far as any business lines or emails, and you may want to reach me at, I'll put that in the description of the podcast uh, when I upload it. So uh, coming up next on the Mike in New Haven podcast, another really interesting episode on tap. It was a firebombing of a synagogue in Riverdale out in the, North, in the North Bronx, and it was the first crime to be charged under the New York State hate crimes law that had recently been passed. This occurred in October of 2000. And among the investigators that helped uh, bring the uh, firebombers to justice, well, my friend Bill Ryan, retired NYPD detective first grade. He will be returning next week for what will be another volume of Tales from the Boom Room, profiles of the NYPD's arson and explosion and bomb squad. He started it off with volumes one and two, and he'll come back for what I believe will be volume 14. So very much looking forward to chatting with Bill. And on behalf of Alex Alonzo, I am Mike Cologne, and we will see you next time. Take care, everyone. Take care, Mike.